we can't really talk about the consumer changes in American society um, unless we talk about the um, early 19th century and what we would call, um, what many have called already, the market revolution. Okay? Um, these were changes that came about um, with uh, the period of what you know is popularly called the industrial revolution. Uh, but this market revolution that we had, uh, and which kind of um, overarches, I guess, uh, this in, you know this entire period, let's say, from about um, I don't know uh, 18, uh, 1830 or so uh, until about 1900. Um, were changes um, in, let's say, um, uh, the economic base, I'll use a little bit socialist language there, um, the base of American society uh, that affected its superstructure, I guess, in some ways. Um, changes, revolutions that happened. Um, first and foremost, perhaps, in communication itself. Uh, a rise in American literacy with the introduction of public schools um, at about 1830, okay? Um, the uh, promulgation of newspapers uh, that began with the penny press around 1820 or so, and, you know, examples of like Benjamin Day's New York Sun, you know, people could suddenly afford newspapers, and newspapers didn't simply carry um, business news uh, meant for a mercantile audience. Um, the economic organization of the country as well, uh, the role of, say, banks and stocks and shareholders, and the kind of changes that that affected on people. Uh, and on you know people's understanding of the society in which they lived, uh, and of course technological changes as well, um, telegraphs and typewriters and cash registers and sewing machines and all these types of things that were going to appear over the next seventy years or so. Um, but let's get back first to the beginning here. As I was saying. America had originally began, to sort of try to illustrate these things as best I can, as an agrarian society, okay? People basically lived in small, ruralish communities, okay? Um, you know, agrarian, as I said, uh, farming communities. Um, most people didn't really travel more than 30 miles from their home, let's say in their lifetime. Um, you know, the people who they knew were the people who were, you know, raised right next to them. And I can imagine that this was a very limited life, but it was a life that also had a sense of identity as well about it. And I suppose a sense of belonging, uh, however limited uh, and however short um, that life may have been. Okay? Uh, and in fact, the agrarian life, uh, the American agrarian life, was always something of an ideal, we can say. And you still see it being idealized uh, long after, I, I mean, you know, like in the North, uh, this is in uh, New England, um, long after um, industrialism uh, had, you know, pretty much become the way of the country. Yeah. Um, what happens to this agrarian life during the Industrial Revolution, of course, is that it moves a lot of people to the cities. Farm jobs, of course, are lost, you know, during it, during every technological change, you know, not unlike our own. Um, there's always a displacement of a, you know, of a, you know, significant portion of the workforce that made its money off of the um, old uh, and now um, obsolete ways of living. Um, so there's this move to the urban environment. Um, and the urban environment itself becomes an engine of industrialism, 
you know, um, the types of encounters that occur there. And if we just sort of take <clears throat> take a look at some of this here. Um, you know, this is a, this is, a, you know, I mean, <laughs> compared with that agrarian environment, we have this, you know, urban landscape here, 19th century. You can see the burgeoning and the um, speckling of factories around. Um, you know, again, um, you know, the types of, you know, this is, you know, more or less typical city scene from that time as well. Um, again, of course, with everything in the city, you know, there's a place of both, um, you know, uh, uh, both uh, virtue and vice, I would say. If you, people move into the city, there are more opportunities naturally at the time to, you know, you know expand your understanding of the world, um, educational opportunities, um, increases in l literacy rates, but naturally as well there's all sorts of um, what was once um, unbeknown vice there as well. And this is a typical, I don't know, I guess I found this here, it's a typical New York street gang, mid 19th century, and um, working conditions of course at the time during industrialism uh, were um, you know, quite um, both bleak you know, uh, this is just, this is a famous photo by Joseph Riss uh, from the late 19th century, and I guess that's a sweatshop, you know, of some kind. Um, so again, what happens during this, um, you know, this uh, evolution of this modern marketing era in the 19th century? Well, there are widespread efforts to, to distribute, promote, and sell mass products to nearly all of society. Uh, local stores, the way things were purchased, you know, um, the way things were purchased in small towns and rural communities, um, it was generally a small store, let's say, um, under one roof. Goods that were sold were generally local made um, stores tended to serve comprehensive needs. You would have leather goods, you would have tools, you would have jarred goods, uh, you would have tobacco, you would have all of these things under one roof. You know, they tended to be small, windowless affairs. Uh, and it was still possible to go in there and walk away with goods without necessarily having cash. Um, one of, I mean, a lot of these small rural, um, rural communities ran their own economy, okay? So you could barter uh, and you could trade as well. Urban shopping, and this is just uh, Mulberry Street in New York in the late 19th century, um, urban shopping was a very different kind of experience. Um, you needed to have fresh goods every day there um, because there was a very high d demand for them. Um, what happened though over the 19th century was that <clears throat> a lot of these crowded outdoor markets that you saw all over the city finally gave way to things which we call specialty shops, uh, meaning that there would be a specific place to buy food, another, you know, another place that you would buy tobacco, um, another place that you would buy um, 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 uh, any sort of things that you um, needed, you know, tools or things like that around the house. Um, and something else about urban shopping too was play, was per, per price fluctuations. Um, the prices of goods were not steady, okay? They tended to change from day to day, um, which is something that was almost, um, which was really unheard of uh, in most rural communities. Um, people really became consumers and kind of um, at the mercy of the market. Um, so Americans started to get, you know, this kind of understanding of a larger economic system uh, outside of their own, say, centralized rural community. Um, 
with the with the coming of the Civil War, <clears throat> uh, this gives the consumer e economy as well um, a push forward. Um, the North urges the free labor force, <clears throat> um, you know, to help fill jobs uh, in the northern industrial um, cities. What the uh, but what America looked like naturally around the mid 19th century was, of course, you had this industrialized North with lots of factories and you know, you know, um, you know, centralized. I mean, central urban areas and things like that. Uh, and you had a South uh, that was pretty much still agrarian. You know, uh, there were unpaved roads still down there. Um, you know, it basically worked on a slave labor economy. Uh, and the North was advancing in a, you know, um, a very different kind of direction. So the North, of course, naturally wants this free labor force. Um, the first national advertising campaign that we have is to help sell war bonds. Okay. <clears throat> um, the government sort of uses these new, um, you know, these new means of communication that we have, you know, newspapers, um, broadly distributed newspapers, uh, to sell, uh, to raise money for the war, okay? Uh, it also uses other sort of newish techniques at the time, poster campaigns, uh, to help recruit army volunteers as well. Um, improved printing techniques, um, naturally, um, help meet the demand for wartime news. Um, the adoption of a national currency in 1863, up until that time, it was left up to states to pretty much regulate banks and to issue currency and such things. The adoption of a national currency in 1863 helps to expand markets as well. You know, um, once the money that you send is considered good, right, uh, in a neighboring state, it's a lot easier to do business, of course. Um, some other things that come around um, that, you know, that sort of make their appearance around that time is our modern methods of packaging uh, and canning. Canning had been around, <clears throat> canning goods, um, you know, again, this is for, you know, um, urban customers who are not growing their own food, suddenly you need food that you can preserve in a cupboard. Canning had been around since the early 19th century, well not early, say about you know, like 1830, 1840 or so, um, but it really became popular naturally um, during the Civil War, uh, after the Civil War. Uh, civilians, um, you know, took advantage of uh, canned goods um, um, as well. Um, it, it was difficult, often at times, to get people to trust what were in cans, right? If, if you were, you know, if you were from a rural community, you were naturally used to having fresh vegetables and things like that. And, um, you know, there were, of course, there were all kinds of stories that had circulated, you know, about you know how unhealthy eating canned food is, and the types of things that you would find in the can that you didn't want to see, and whatnot. And you know, this went on for decades and decades until 1906. Um, for that was one reason you had the um, uh, National uh, Food and Drug Act as well to to assure people of the cleanliness of prepackaged foods. Uh, and of course, a very important invention, very hard for us to understand, you know, um, at this time, why it was such a big deal, but the can opener uh, as well well, was considered like really amazing technology, you know, um, you know, at this time, and this is 1876, this one, you know, um, you can't open cans unless you have a can opener, uh, and it was considered quite important, you know. Um, Another thing that we could look at, aside from 
um, the changes in ways that Americans um, gathered food, I guess you can say, um, was um, what they wore. Um, a sewing machine had come out in 1856, was the first family sewing machine. <clears throat> Isaac Merritt Singer didn't invent the sewing machine, by the way, but he helped to refine, um, but, he, um, but, but he significantly refined it, made it viable, uh, and had a great business sense as well. Um, he makes it available for home use, you know, uh, in the mid-19th century, again, uh, 1856. Also, I mean, like as I was saying, as a very smart businessman, he also created installment buying. Um, that was a new concept as well. The fact that you could put down, say, $10 on it, and then say, I don't know, 50 cents a week or something, until the thing was paid for, was unheard of at that time. Um, again, it's not usually the inventor who runs away uh, with the uh, credit for innovations, uh, but rather the one who has the business sense to carry it forward. Um, you know, the sewing machine, I just very briefly, um, caused all kinds of havoc. Um, when it was introduced in Europe, uh, there were riots in the streets by, of course, tailors and the like, because they figured, you know, that this sort of thing was going to put them out of business. Um, Singer's shop, uh, Singer had a shop, shops in London and Paris, and they were burned down uh, in such things as first. Um, but that didn't, but, but, you know, that didn't stop Americans who are always crazy about technology and whatnot. Uh, in fact, when the sewing machine first came about, they would show it off at like fairgrounds and whatnot. They would charge people like five cents, you know, to see how it works and whatnot. The Americans were always willing to do that. And again, our national fascination with technology and futuristic things. Um, so what else does the sewing machine bring us? Uh, it brings us um, pret-a-porter, clothes, ready to make, um, ready to wear, um, outfits, whatnot. Uh, what did American clothes look like earlier? Well, there wasn't a lot of them. I mean, well, <laughs> not a lot of clothes. There, there wasn't a lot of different kinds. Uh, kinds of clothes. Uh, people usually uh, often only owned um, one set of clothes. They were often homemade. Uh, they were often ill-fitting, you know, and whatnot. Um, but America became something of a democracy of clothes. Uh, European reporters visiting Americans, uh, I mean, visiting America, uh, often commented uh, on the uh, on the fancy dress of its citizens, <clears throat> um, you know that they would write things. You know, French journalists would write that. You know, it was a it was kind of odd to see chambermaids or railroad workers or people like that wearing suits on the job. Um, this was very different from the European traditions, where what type of clothes you wore indicated what social class you were from. Um, America, of course, even at that time, um, don't like to talk about things like that. Um, social class is a dirty word. Um, you know, and it's kind of always stayed in our personality, I guess, that it's um, taboo topic. We're not, we're supposed to be a classless society, you know, as such. Um, with men gone to war, and this is already, you know, back in the Civil War as well, um, women relied more on factory created and store bought goods, um, ready to wear clothes, canned foods, um, and the such. Uh, and this trend continues after the Civil War, as you can see, you know, that sort of evolution towards. Uh, what we might uh, call um, um, a, um, a buyer's market, I guess, in some ways. Um, here we have 
if we just have for a second, this is a picture of, I, I apologize for the light, I mean, realize this is not ideal here. This is the Beaumarche Marsh department store in Paris in 1869. Um, it's the model for which American department stores take. Um, so after the Civil War, you have new methods of advertising and promotion. And they encourage people to indulge their pleasure in shopping for new clothes and new furnishings. Okay? So this European ideal, again, this, this Beau Marsh, this very fancy building here in the back, the, the European idea of large retail shops and whatnot comes to America in the form of the department store. Okay? Um, the department store, you could argue in some ways, uh, and again, that's what I was mentioning Coney Island earlier, um, is in some ways, if I, and I'll explain this, I guess, I mean, a forerunner of amusement parks. Okay? Um, our idea of a good time uh, became shopping. Uh, shopping for most people, shopping, shopping for most people um, was not a fun activity. Uh, it was not something relaxing that you did, you know, like on a Sunday, you know, you didn't go to, you know, like the mall or the store. Uh, shopping for many Americans um, before these type of large institutions um, was, a, was a very stressful, oftentimes humiliating experience. You would go into a store, and it's basically all specialty shops, uh, and immediately um, a clerk would come to you and say, you know, yes, madam, can I help you with this and whatnot? And if you weren't there to buy, if you were just in there out of just pure curiosity, out of what the goods looked like or whatnot, <clears throat> um, you know, you were asked, you know, to leave, you know, you know essentially, you know. Um, what, what department stores did was it made, <clears throat> was it put on display, and you can see the size of this thing, this is unbelievably large, um, put on display goods where people could go in, touch the goods, see them, there wouldn't be a Clark running after you, you know, asking you, you know, can I help you or something like that. You were basically left to indulge your curiosity in them. And the stores were made to be the most attractive buildings in the city, whether it was Wanamaker's in, oh, I'm sorry, that's 1976. That should be 1876, pardon me. Um, it could be, I mean, it could be Wanamaker's in Philadelphia or uh, Macy's in New York or uh, any number of stores, um, they were built um, with the idea of show in mind. Um, Siegel Cooper, long, long gone type of thing, uh, that was in New York and it's you know, like the largest, most imposing building around there, you know, at the time. Let me see if I haven't, uh, again, well, that's just an ad from it. Where is that now is, I do not, I'm not sure exactly where it was located, but the department stores, I can tell you right now, early department stores were in what is now the most northern part of Greenwich Village. So in the mid to 20s or something. Later on, they moved up to around Times Square. That's how Times Square became sort of like the, the like hub of transportation because that's where all of the stores were and whatnot. But in earlier days, I know that they were further downtown. Okay. <clears throat> um, you know, so, so it gave people, you know, I mean, I mean this, you know, um, um, this you know, idea to have a uh, tactile relationship uh, uh, with goods. Um, department stores also had an effect on public spaces as well, and urban, development with these types of constructions also came like cast iron and whatnot. Um, stores used to have uh, no windows on them. You had to go inside to see what was going on. <clears throat> now you have stores with huge plate glass windows where you could put on display. Window shopping becomes something that people, uh, people can do now at this point. Okay. 
Um, there's also, department stores also brought technology, um, much like much like the way people enjoyed looking at sewing machines and whatnot and, and, and how they looked. Um, people liked going into department stores to ride the escalator or ride the elevator. Well, it was considered an amazing thing at the time. Stairs that moved. Um, no one had ever seen anything like that. You know, uh, in fact, they needed to have somebody by the escalator or by the elevator to show people that it was safe. You know, they would hop on, you know, go up, you know, come back down, you're still in one piece, you know. Um, but the, this consumerist element of it became a display. I, I mean, again, I, I mean, it's not very different from, say, uh, the, um, I don't know, something at Coney Island, like the uh, steeplechase or, you know, something like that. You know, that same type of um, idea that it's a carnival atmosphere. Um, you know, again, this is just an ad from Siegel Cooper. Yes, I was absolutely correct. Sixth Avenue, 18th and 19th Streets, right at the bottom. Um, you know, uh, I mean, again, this is just you know example of what ads, you know, ads look like at the time. This is Macy's uh, around the same era. This is the probably the 1890s or so, and I just want you to just like just do a. <laughs> I mean, like, just to appreciate the largeness of it. I mean, just you know, huge, huge buildings. I mean, all of the best architecture put into, you know, like this, this type of thing. And uh, and and of course, they were also uh, fame. I mean, I was just talking about um, window displays and whatnot. <clears throat> um, again, this changes urban spaces. Um, uh, one by instead of going for a walk, let's say in the park, people now go for a walk to look at goods, you know, or to look at um, attractive displays in, say, store windows. In any case, they are in the proximity of something to buy, you know, <clears throat> uh, and that continues until like our day as well, um, you know. I think um, if you look at the way. Um, shopping malls were arranged uh, back in the, you know, back in their heyday in the 70s, let's say, you know, that they were arranged to look like public parks with fountains in the middle, but they weren't public parks at all. They were the opposite. They were commercialized space. But um, even if you look at what's sort of taken the, taken the place of shopping malls, I believe, um, strips and strips of brand name specialty stores, they're also arranged in a sort of park-like manner, you know, I believe. Uh, Woolworths, this is another sort of um, innovation that comes about. Um, in 1879, F.W. Woolworth opens his first five cent store in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He has a very ingenious idea in doing this as well. Um, he worked on a railroad, I believe, at first, uh, and with the mail order catalog businesses, I'll get to that in a moment, that were booming, there was a lot of shipping going out from major places, um, major manufacturing cities like, say, Chicago and whatnot. Um, not all of those goods were picked up by the people who ordered them, right? So it cost more money to ship the goods back than it was, you know, to just sort of, I guess, leave them there and sell them at a discount. Woolworth started acquiring all of these goods and whatnot, and he put them in a store, you know, I mean, not anything like major, but small everyday items that people need on a daily basis. And he figured that he could sell them <clears throat> at a bargain Discount. So he opens this five, his first five cent store in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, not only did he have a great business sense about that, uh, he also had a wonderful sense about modern sales techniques. Display. How to display items in a store. Um, how to stack them in a way that people found attractive. Um, 
how to put, I mean, how fast things would sell, I mean, if you put them, like, on the counter by the register or something like that. You know, um, a lot of these ideas, uh, he made the most of them. So items in the store, though, they were defined by cost, not by category or purchaser. What happens when you do that is you start encouraging impulse buys, you know? You know, like... Nobody goes to, well, nobody necessarily, okay, I was going to say nobody necessarily went to Woolworths looking for something. They were just interested in what cost five cents. Maybe they did have some idea of something that might be there, but if they went in there, they surely came out with a lot of other stuff, okay? Um, so he was all about display and impulse buys. Uh, in the 1890s, though, he introduced... 10 cent items as well, okay? But he was very smart as he kept the 10 cent items separate from the 5 cent items. I, I mean, it's, I'm not sure we can really appreciate it at this point, but what that does with people's sense of buying and the purpose of buying something is he puts the focus on, oh, it's so cheap, as opposed to, oh, I really need this, you know? Um, it's, it's, it was, you know, I, I mean, like, and again, I, I mean, this is a very interesting backdrop, I think. I mean, um, is that the American character, up until this time, was defined almost exclusively by frugality, you know. Um, what, I don't know, what, the, what you might call, I mean, as part of the Protestant ethic, right? Um, Americans were supposed to be, you know, frugal. Uh, conservative, um, self-reliant, um, not ostentatious, um, not showy. Um, I, I mean, like, that's what they told you in church all the time. And now you have all of this sudden access to goods, um, to um, luxuries, to conveniences. Convenience was a new word in those days. No one ever heard the no one had ever heard of anything being convenient before, you know. Um, these are all new concepts that come across with these things. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention the mail order catalogs as well. Oh, again, this is the inside of a Woolworths. Um, what we might call a junk shop, right? Um, but uh, that's, it was basically five cent goods just stacked one on top of another. You know? um, Again, I just like this, uh, I don't know, this is another outside of a Woolworths and I guess uh, coffee pots and whatnot. And I don't know, I just like the woman standing there. Geez, I wonder what happened to her. <laughs> um, mail order catalogs is another part of the business as well. Um, and, and this is kind of a very interesting sort of American phenomenon, I think, too. Um, in 1872, Chicago-based Montgomery Ward began this first mass market general merchandising catalog. I mean, like people think it was Sears that started it. Actually, it wasn't. It was Montgomery Ward. Um, in 1872, the catalog held 163 items. The catalog became a classic of American publishing, um, mostly for the effect that it had on um, unsettled areas out west. There was a lot of movement west at the time. Um, and with the expansion of the railroads um, and the Postal Act of 1879, which lowered the cost of sending goods and printed materials as well, um, the mail order catalog business became essential for folks settling out west. In fact, many homes, you know, if it didn't have, you know, if it had no reading material, it had at least two things. It had a Bible, uh, and it had a Montgomery Ward or a Sears catalog there. Uh, the catalogs were often used, and I'm talking about, you know, parts of the west that were really remained um, very sparse until uh, the 20th century. Um, the catalogs were used for many things. I mean, outside of ordering goods, they were often used in schools uh, to teach literacy uh, 
as well as the Bible and whatnot. Um, but they really became essential. Um, Sears and Roebuck, <clears throat> well, I mean, in fact, uh, folks in rural communities called this thing, you know, the wish book, you know, for things that they wished for. And, you know, you had almost everything in it. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen, they have reprinted these things many times. And something that I used to enjoy looking at were reproductions of these, but they literally had everything in them from cradle to grave. I mean, if you could see, uh, you could get tombstones in them as well as baby carriages. Uh, they had a whole line of caskets in the back. Um, very odd looking, creepy Victorian woodcuts, you know, um, displaying them. Um, these woodcuts were, you know, children used to make paper dolls out of the, you know, um, human figures in them and whatnot. Um, Sears ups one, though. I mean, kind of puts in a game changer, though. Uh, Sears enters it as well, and it says, send no money now. Again, that's how people like Woolworth got started in that story that I just told. Sears actually says, send no money now. Just tell us what you want. We'll send it to you, and it'll be COD, right? Um, they build this trust with the consumer. Um, apparently it's stated, and I don't know, I mean, it's always hard to believe these kinds of things when it says, well, the per president of the company personally answers every letter from every customer himself. Um, that's what they said about Sears. You know, Sears was like personally answered every inquiry from every customer. You know, people sent him, you know, just cash in the mail and stuff like that, and their items always wound up there. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's not entirely, entirely the sure Ruth, but the fact that stories like that exist. Um, in fact, there are stories about Sears getting letters from um, lonely men out on the frontier, you know, asking if there are any women in his catalog that, that they could send out. Um, no, these guys were being sincere. I mean, they were, I mean, very, 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 because everything else you needed was in there, you know. Why, you know, why not? Mail order brides, exactly. There you go. <laughs> um, so amidst all of this change, um, amid all of, um, amidst all of this change, you see a rise uh, in the practice of advertising. Um, and uh, I don't want to get into the history of advertising or things like that, but just I'll say just um, very, very briefly, um, advertising as a profession, as in, a, you know, in the country, didn't really exist until the mid-1800s. Businessmen did advertising. It was considered a part of selling your goods, but to have a person dedicated to advertising didn't really happen until the mid-1800s, okay? Uh, you needed things for that, in fact, for it. Um, you needed one, um, effective transportation to make it worthwhile, uh, and you needed a mass media. Um, and until the pro proliferation of newspapers, uh, there was none of that. The first actual advertising agent, Volney Palmer, was in Philadelphia in the 1840s. Uh, leased, I mean, bought space in newspapers and resold it at a profit to merchants. Uh, so one thing to take away from that um, is um, the rise of American news culture uh, with the rise of advertising. The one has always been dependent on the other. Okay? Um, and basically, the history of advertising uh, up until um, relatively recently has been that relationship uh, and how it works. Buying space or time from the media and reselling it to a business or to an advertiser of some kind, okay? Uh, so, you, so like I said, you had Volney Palmer in Philadelphia in the 1840s, uh, George P. Rowell uh, in Boston in 1865, uh, Francis Ayer in New York 
in 1869, and over this period of time, from the 40s to the 70s at that point, um, the size of the operation, the advertising operation, grew larger and larger and larger. They could cover more and more space, uh, involved more and more people. Um, and, and it finally came down to, with Ayer, established the 15% rule. I, I don't know, this is, this is important in advertising. Um, which was that you bought space from the newspaper, you know, or the, well, I guess if we took it up to our time, from the TV station and all, um, all those types of things, uh, and you sold it at a 15% profit, okay, to whoever wanted to advertise. Uh, that has recently gone out the window. In fact, that's, that's, I mean, like it was that way up until about the 1990s or so, right? Uh, and now all of that has changed with the technological changes that we've had. Uh, and it's all basically contracted now. So just, just giving you some, just a little bit of insight there, uh, how much the advertising industry uh, and the news culture um, has changed uh, in our country uh, just in the last 25 years or so. Okay? In any case, going back to the 19th century, um, what was the biggest part of their advertising businesses, you know, the Palmers and the Rolls and the Ayers? Of course, patent medicines, right? Uh, that was the biggest business of the time. Uh, patents, of course, coming from the, you know, uh, coming from the um, English use of the term, uh, meaning approved by the government. Uh, patent medicines in America were not approved by any such thing, okay? Um, of course, and they were loaded with all sorts of good stuff like cocaine and morphine and, you know, and I guess all, you know, alcohol. Uh, and it was supposed to cure everything, and I guess it did. I mean, including life itself, I'm betting, you know. Uh, it, it was, um, but it was, I mean, but you have to understand that these things were the backbone. Um, there was no FDA or anything like that. Uh, this was the backbone of the, of the advertising industries, and of course, you know, Americans like magic, right? You know, they like um, spectacle and magic and, you know, all those types of things. So they like things that are going to, if you just eat it or drink it or swallow it, it'll make you all better, you know? Um, so, so this was a huge business um, at the time. Um, naturally, it didn't hurt that you had the Civil War a couple of just a couple of decades, I mean, just, I mean, in memory, right, at the time. Um, so much like after the end of the First World War uh, and the Second World War, and, and every war for that matter, uh, you, you, you had American men coming back, you know, with like all types of war wounds and actually all types of addictions to painkillers um, and whatnot. Um, what else? I mean, and also you can imagine what health care was like in those days. Um, poor diets, uh, high rates of d d disease, um, and the push westward of Americans uh, into areas uh, where there were no doctors at all, right? Um, huge industry uh, back then. Um, again, here's just snake oil, actual snake oil. Um, Relieves instantaneously, rattlesnake oil, okay? And uh, Winslow's soothing syrup for children's teething, you know, if a child is upset because they are teething, you know, you give them this syrup, which is probably loaded with whiskey or something like that, or, or morphine, God knows what was in it, you know? Um, and of course, this all comes to an end at some point. Um, again, in 1906, um, uh, you have the uh, Food and Drug Act, where the government wants to sort of regulate uh, what's going into cans, uh, what's going into packages, uh, and what's going into medicine bottles. And this, I guess, this is an expose from the, you know, from around that era, from around 1900 or so. Uh, investigative journalism at its best, you know, <coughs> I'm guessing. Um, 
But on the brighter side, not all of them were uh, not all of them were so devious. Um, the first uh, national nationally successful advertising campaign, um, and, and I use the campaign. I'll, let's say campaign with a small C. All right. I mean, um, uh, the first popular advertising um, was Lydia Pinkham. Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound. Um, there were very, I, I'm like, there were no women doctors really back then, none. So if, so if a woman had like menstrual cramps or you know, female ailments, whatever they called them, you know, things like that, um, it was kind of, you know, you, you know, you had to go to a male doctor uh, and the male doctor was probably not a fun experience and whatnot. Um, so it became popular for women to sort of put things out that, you know, that help you with that kind of stuff. Lydia Pinkham had the brilliant idea to put herself on the label um, and to sort of, this becomes a trend that attracts Americans to products and brand names themselves, is that you put a trusting face there. Let's say if this is supposed to be a compound, you know, that's supposed to help ease women's um, menstrual pains or things like that. And I don't know what was in it. I mean, I, I, it's all sorts of like vegetables and probably a, sh a shot of rum or something or <laughs> something like that, right? Um, and, and I'm sure it was meant well. Um, but you can see what she does with this. Like, women can sympathize with women. Health of woman is the hope of the race. And puts this trusting older woman on the bottle. So younger women look at it, and it's almost like the guy, uh, like also around the same time, get back to this for a second, the Qu Quaker Oats man, right? It was another thing that Americans like these characters that inspired paternal protection and love, right? Um, the Quaker Oats man was, was the first successful one of those, one of the first, you know, uh, why? Well, it's a Quaker, right? He's a friend, right? And I call them friends, right? Okay? He's a friend, you know? Um, and, and you see the same thing kind of is going on here as well. Is, you know, like, you know, you could trust her. So, so this, uh, this affection between the population and, say, brand names and whatnot uh, is evolving uh, at that time. And this is, this is a card they used to put Trading cards, by the way. I just like this because it has the Brooklyn Bridge on it and whatnot. Um, I'm not. Sh I, I, I mean. I, I mean. I read somewhere. I believe that they literally hung a sign outside of it. That was the first time that a that outdoor advertising had ever been done. That, that they had actually hung something like that. I'm not sure if I believe it. I, I mean. I'm not sure I believe it. In any case, this trading card exists. They used to put these things in. Uh, you know, used to hand them out in the street and whatnot and put them in packages to remind people to buy them again. Um, so what contributes to a lot of this uh, culture of consumption um, as well? Um, well, <clears throat> the rapid growth of urbanization after the Civil War, um, the advent of public schooling by the time you get to the end of the 19th by the time you get towards the end of the 19th century, you have 90% literacy rate in the country. Okay? Um, you have unprecedented scales of economy, right? Uh, and you have the, the development of um, marketing, of advertising, of campaigns. Again, we have one here. Crisco, one of the first advertising campaigns. And I'll say this is campaign with a large C. Okay? By that I mean that all of this research had gone into it. Probably the first time. This is a little bit later than we're talking about. This is about, you know, you know like 1910 or so. But um, one of the things that was very attract that was considered attractive at the turn of the last century was making consumer advancements seem scientific. Meaning like if you look at this type of, I mean, new food products that are supposed to be the result of science. Because America was supposed to be the country of science, right? You had all of these immigrants coming in from like different parts of Europe and they were very poor and 
considered very backward and all this kind of stuff. And they come into this country and there's all this, this new science and way of doing things. This ad looks like a page from a science journal, in fact. You know, um, Crisco was the first one to do a large scale campaign with market research and traveling around the country and it made a major change in the American diet. Um, what did people fry things in um, for most of history was lard or some other type of animal fat. Uh, and what you have now um, is this stuff that comes from plant fat and it was supposed to be considered more healthy for you than eating all of that animal fat. Well, Crisco put an enormous amount of effort uh, into um, um, basically canvassing the country with salespeople and demonstrations and you know, you know um, all sorts of deals struck with um, railway lines to use it in their um, meal cars and whatnot uh, and sent around to American families um, recipe books right uh, this is the first time that you have I mean you know how if you buy a product well it used to be I don't know what it still is I mean but you if you buy a product in the supermarket um, some sort of you know thing and you look at the back of it there'll be recipes on it I mean like it's basically encouraging you to change your dietary habits in order to include this thing in it Crisco was the first one to really use that type of strategy um, as well. Um, so you, you know, have with all of this expansion uh, new national organizations of managers, uh, distributors, salesmen and buyers um, out there uh, and the products uh, that emerge at this time. Um, American Tobacco, Borden, Campbell's Soup, Carnation, Coca-Cola, Colgate Palmolive, Eastman Kodak, Quaker Oats, Heinz, Libby, Pillsbury, Procter & Gamble, and the National Biscuit Company, later known as Nabisco, names that we still know very, very well. Uh, all, um, all emerged in this period of uh, rapid expansion, um, uh, rapid sophistication of marketing techniques. In fact, the word marketing was new, okay? Marketing was not really a 19th century word. Uh, it was a word uh, that comes about in the early 20th century, right? Nobody knew what marketing was, uh, and certainly not marketing science. Uh, there was no science to it, right? Now suddenly there was. Um, you know, and, and you know, like um, other things too. Um, assisting retailers uh, with product promotions and sales training and, and literature and customer demonstrations and all of these other things sort of come together at one time. Okay. Um, just one last thing here again this is just uh, these are people from the um, gilded age as we call it uh, costuming of that uh, costuming of that time okay um, so even though sophisticated market segmentation now, as we know it now uh, had not yet occurred, um, it was clear that the ideal target for most mass-produced items were women, okay? Um, Victorian literature at that time, we should bear in mind, helped to form our idea uh, of what roles men and women were, uh, what the idea looked like, and what roles each should perform, okay? Um, so, this consumer economy emerges, and I guess this is just sort of a side note in a way, at the same time as what our ideas of what is, what is, um, what is expected of a woman and what is expected of a man, but mostly of a woman. Because they are the ones who are reading the magazines. They were the ones who were doing the shopping. And they are the ones who become ultimately affected and even have their consciousness of gender <clears throat> um, um, affected by this, uh, by these um, 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 consumer and advertising ideals. Okay, um, you might tie into this, I guess, for the 
um, uh, Thorsten, um, Thorsten Veblen's ideas of conspicuous consumption around the same time, uh, that the amount of goods that you can accumulate should be put on display, um, uh, that to, um, again, um, that your wealth um, should be worn uh, mostly on your wife, right? Uh, how well your wife was decked out was an indicator uh, of your own success in life. Um, and this, with the amount of um, available goods and advertised, um, and advertised things, helps us. And um, uh, um, just one last idea here, uh, Jackson Lears um, um, also has written about around this time, um, not just, um, uh, not just um, Veblen's idea of conspicuous consumption, but Lears's idea of therapeutic ethos, um, meaning that the old ideals that I was talking about earlier, um, American ideas of um, modesty, frugality, um, um, saving, conservatism, and uh, is replaced with this um, therapeutic ethos of consumption. Um, that somehow um, what was once found in ideas of, say, um, religious ideals uh, is now found in the marketplace. Uh, and you see that up until our own time. If you, know, if you notice, one of the things um, that, that Americans love more than anything, you know, I know I keep generalizing, I'm, I'm allowed to do that, I'm an American, you know, um, is self-help books and self-help ideas uh, and all sorts of new age things that you have to buy, right? Um, if you just, you know, I, I mean, um, uh, 10 ways to instant happiness. Um, you know, it's, it, it all comes from this, you know, consumer idea that you could simply buy solutions to your problems very easily. Um, and I've been going on, so on that note, I'll end it and take any questions you might have. Canning goes back to the early 19th century, so it was before the Civil War. But they really exploded as a, I mean, obviously as a practical thing, uh, mostly for the North, because they're the ones that had all the factories and whatnot. Um, but canning goods goes back to like the 1840s. Uh, and they were used for settlers going out West, I believe, first. Uh, and then they were incorporated into, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, obviously they became a big part of Lincoln's army, you know. Uh, and, and, and then it was afterwards that that technology, let's call it technology, because war, wars leave us with all sorts of great technology that you could use in your home, you know? You know? No, well, no, I'm, I'm like, if you look at every war has left us with something that becomes adopted. I mean, think about um, in the 50s, uh, TV dinners. Where did that come from? Uh, that came from the mess hall, you know? I, I, I mean, you know, like, and, you know, like, if you look around the house, you could figure out what must have had its start in a war, you know? I mean, you know, um, you know, in some way. Uh, and as I was saying, I'm like, it took a, um, a while, uh, especially for immigrants to America, uh, to really trust canned and packaged goods. Packaging was also new at the time, you know, I, I mean, like as well. Um, people wanted to see their food before they bought it. I mean, like much as they want to do now again, but for different reasons. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like some of the photographs that I've seen of these places, they look like Arabian palaces. I mean, like nothing like they looked, I mean, my experience of department stores is from like the 1960s and 70s. And by that time they were more utilitarian looking, you know, but uh, some of the photographs that I've seen of these places from, I, I mean, from the first part of this, I mean, of the last century and the late 19th century, is that they were really, I mean, made, I, I mean, they really looked like Coney Island. I, I mean, in a way, you know. Um, and that was done uh, entirely on purpose, you know, in order to have people basically come in for the entertainment value, as you say, of, you know, you know, you know I mean, of seeing it. But it's really, I mean, it's like where America, at least locally, put all of its best architecture, you know. Uh, I mean, um, you know, I mean, all of its thought, uh, all of its creativity, uh, all of it is fueled by business, um, you know, uh, by the expansion of business.
Sales, yeah, of course they did. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I mean, um, um, that was always. I, I mean, that was always a. I, I mean, like especially if you're dealing with uh, mass-produced goods as well. Um, the last thing you want to have is a backup of goods sitting in the warehouse. You know, um, whenever that started to happen, I'm sure people lowered the cost of them, and hence you have a sale. I mean, like that's how you have sales now on things because it's just too much of something sitting there. Uh, and if they sit in the warehouse too long, uh, you have a recession, um, as America has every 20 or 30 years. No, I mean, you are helpless. I'm helpless. I mean, no, I, I mean, listen, no advertising, America stops. I, I mean, like, no advertising. If they stopped all advertising, I mean, it's unthinkable. America stops altogether. You stop buying goods. Like I just answered that question, you stop buying things, even things you don't need, right? You stop buying those things, America comes to a halt, right? Um, it's, it's, it's like, like buying is just simply how our economy works. You know, it's, it's what keeps it going. You have to understand that that relationship is there between news and advertising. Um, it simply, I mean, has been. No advertising, no news. Uh, no Ford motor cars, no Coca-Cola, uh, no Standard Oil. I mean, like, none of that, no news. Um, we have to understand what that relationship means, you know. Um, you know, um, uh, that's, uh, you know, I, I mean, like, um, I mean, that's simply, I mean, I don't believe that the, I don't believe that most of the news that we get from, you know, that's sponsored by big advertising is wrong. I mean, like, it isn't that we get bad news. It isn't that we get propaganda. I don't think that's true. I mean, but it is a fact that the type of news and the stories that we get and the stories that are most accessible to us, okay, uh, are a product of who advertises, you know, because advertisers want people to watch the news show, okay? Uh, the, the number one job of any media outlet is to deliver to advertisers an ideal audience to purchase their product, right? That doesn't mean that they're lying to us or giving us fake news. That's ridiculous, you know? I mean, I mean, but it does mean that the stories you're going to hear about are the ones that are going to be most popular with the audience that is tuning in. Other news sources are available, but you have to dig for them. You have your phone on, I mean, um, they're following you in the store aisles. I mean, I was in a store not too long ago where there is, where there was, um, where the price for an item, you know how they have, you know, like, you know, there's, there'll be shelving, right? And they'll have an item there. And there'll be a tag there telling you how much it cost. It was there digitally. It wasn't printed out on paper. So as far as I know, when I'm walking down the aisle, it'll give it one price, okay? If somebody else is walking down the aisle, it might change the price based on the information that they have about my buying habits in the store, things I have bought in the store in the past. That's what it's coming down to. I mean, like they're watching you all over the place. That doesn't mean that they care about you or me personally. I mean, I mean like, what do I do? I'm a college professor in Brooklyn. I mean, who cares? I mean, right? I mean, but like, let's say that I was like some, I mean, <laughs> somebody who wanted, you know, like information on in somewhere, you know? Uh, yeah, it's, it can make you nuts if you think about it, you know? Government regulations always come slower, right? I mean, because there has to be, I mean, I mean, because, right, who is in government? It's older people or it's people who are not really used to the used to this technology or what it does or, you know, I think that just makes sense, you know. Anything else? Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Appreciate you.